our next speaker who has been an inspiration to me uh, and someone from who I have learned a lot about um, many things in life, particularly about investment. Um, Mr. Rick Rule is the president and CEO of Sprott US Holdings. He leads a very highly skilled team of professionals, finance and ge geoscience professionals who enjoy a worldwide reputation in investment management, uh, and he enjoys a worldwide reputation for resource investment management. His topic of the day is, the future is hopeless, but it need not be serious. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Rick Rule. Thank you for that uh, kind introduction, Giant. In this audience, I'm now known as uh, Winston Lambert's best prop. <laughs> uh, the title is, in fact, The Situation is Hopeless but Need Not Be Serious. The subtitle is The Futility of Pessimism. So uh, as I wander through this talk, one of the things that's interesting is um, I, I'm a student of Jace Nelson's too, uh, but I, uh, I mean, Jay was a wonderful guy, and my own reading of Jace Nelson is entirely optimistic as opposed to pessimistic. And I hope by the end of this talk that I will have been half as persuasive as the, the prior talk with regards to Jay's work. I, I need to acknowledge at the outset Robert Friedland, who was the one who first, I think, used the situation is hopeless, but it isn't serious. And I think uh, Robert Friedland himself is a sort of a, a metaphor for what I'm talking about. Robert Friedland, for those of you who don't know him, has been a serially successful uh, explorer, developer, promoter, uh, a, a person who has faced enormous, enormous odds, faced them down and built billion dollar fortunes. How could a long-haired hippie whose uh, initial foray into entrepreneurialism uh, involved psychedelic chemicals uh, ascend to the very heights of exploration and mining worldwide. Well, the truth was that Robert Friedland never let anything negative get in his own way. It never occurred to Robert that he couldn't succeed. He was exploring in Alaska, and it was common knowledge among geologists that gold didn't occur in granites. Well, he found 10 million ounces in granites. Why? He just wasn't particularly interested in what he couldn't do. He was much more interested in what he could do. Nobody believed, although we all knew geologically that West Africa and uh, South America had once been one, were joined and were, of course, moved across by the spreading ridge in the mid-Atlantic. And we all knew that there were tens of million ounces of gold in West Africa. Robert decided if there were tens of millions of ounces in gold in West Africa that there ought to be some on the northern coast of South America, too. Problem was, none had been found till Robert and his found, team found Gross Rosebelt. 10 million ounces. You understand that when he started out, the quest was hopeless, but he decided, of course, that it wasn't serious. Now, he's discovered what I think is the most important copper discovery in 100 years in Congo. Well, if ever there was a place that was hopeless, it's Congo. Corruption, AIDS, malaria, Ebola, an impending civil war. Mercifully now, I'm sort of catching up with Robert because I went through the last Congolese civil war. And it was serious, in fact. Uh, two million people dying is serious. But if you think about what you're trying to achieve, what you understand is that when the situation is hopeless, it doesn't need to be serious for you. I'm going to come across as heartless with what I have to say next, but you need to view the heartlessness in context. Robert has discovered literally billions of pounds of copper, and importantly, he's discovered these billions of pounds of copper in concentrations that are large enough to overcome almost any obstacle. It is likely that the government of Congo is going to conspire to steal some of that copper. It is also, I believe, likely that there's going to be a civil war in Congo in the not-too-distant future, like there was in the middle part of the 90s. 
My last experience with copper in the middle part of the 90s, Doug remembers this, with Tanke Fungarumi, is that we got involved in 1994 and unfortunately, immediately, war ensued and millions of people were killed on top of our copper. Uh, it's occurred to me after the fact, because it was a, actually a great financial event for me, that the copper had been put in place 45, 50 million years before, and the copper itself was completely unconcerned about the stupidity of the people who were killing each other on top of the ore body. Um, I don't mean to make a joke, but the ground became a little more red. Civil war eventually subsided, and that deposit has gone on to make a billion dollars a year. Now, I don't want to suggest at the beginning of this talk that all aspects of life are material. Most of what I'm going to talk about in my speech today involves material outcomes as opposed to other types of outcomes, not because I think that material outcomes are more important than any other sort of facets of your experience, only because my experience through life has been mostly material and I talk to it. When I read back or listen to <clears throat> some of the earlier speeches I've given at Capitalism and Morality, uh, I come to understand that people conflate all of my speeches with materiality because that's the only thing I know very much about. And I don't mean to suggest that it's only the material that's important. But I wanted, I wanted to put this, this in, in the context of Robert Friedland at the very beginning so that people could understand where I'm going. Before I go further, I need to be polite. Um, how many people here were at my conference last week? Thank you. Um, thank, uh, thank you all for attending my speech. And, Thank you all for uh, abandoning for a little while at least mammon, which is what we did uh, in favor of philosophy, which is what Jayant does. And thank you, Jayant and Raj Rajni, having come off a conference myself, I understand just how difficult this is. So I'd like everybody in the audience to join me in giving a round of applause for Rajni and Jayant. I pulled the same trick last year, by the way. Uh, every veteran speaker makes sure that he or she gets one good applause line in a talk, and I just did it to you, so thank you for that applause. Um, my, uh, my thesis now, I guess, is that uh, long-term optimism is a strategy, uh, and caution, as opposed to pessimism, is a tactic. And there's a place for both in your life but I'm going to argue with you that the idea that long-term pessimism has any utility, or put differently, uh, long-term pessimism is, in fact, futile. And I'm going to begin by recounting uh, a great conversation that I had in 1999 uh, at the wonderful set of conferences that Doug Casey put on called the Eris Conference. At one point in time, uh, we were leaving the, and you'll remember 1999, the sort of turbulence and stuff like that. But what's important to remember in the context of this speech was, of course, Y2K. You all remember Y2K. There was a problem, I guess, with the, I'm not a technology guy, but there was a problem with the internal clocks and software. And the world was going to end. Uh, it was unsolvable, and the nuclear power plants were going to do whatever nuclear power plants do when they fail, and the clocks weren't going to work. anyway. We were all going to be toast. Uh, I don't know how, how many of you remember Scary Gary. Gary. Um, no, not Gary Alexander. Scary Gary. Thanks. Gary North. At any rate, I was driving from the conference out to Doug Casey's house with a wonderful, wonderful writer named Gary Alexander. And I was saying, Gary, you must be having a field day as a copywriter with Y2K. I mean, this is tailor made for your audience, you know. And Gary said something funny. He says, you know, libertarian people and anarcho-capitalists, I think because of our objection to collectivism and stuff like that, well, we need a self-help group. Uh, and I'm going to call it Apocaholics Anonymous. We have to acknowledge that we have a, a, a failing within ourselves that's greater than ourselves. And we need to acknowledge the need for a greater being. Well, you remember the 12-step program. And Y2K was at that point in time the latest thing that we had invented uh, to be afraid. And if you remember, considering Y2K, particularly if you didn't know too much about computers, the situation was hopeless. We learned in retrospect, of course, that it wasn't serious at all. In my own life, I uh, 
uh, I laugh that between Doug Casey and I, we have called absolutely accurately 18 of the last three declines in the market. We've been absolutely infallible between Doug and I. I mean, there hasn't been one that we have missed, and there have been there are several that we've called that, let's just say, life sailed through. Uh, it's interesting the way that libertarian and anarcho-capitalist people particularly uh, are gloomsters. And it's odd to me because one of the things I see in my life is despite the fact that we mercifully have never ascended to power, there are becoming more of us and we have more tools for dealing with the other people. I'm in fact going to suggest to you that the very fact that uh, V50 and human action principles are published as freeware at liberty.me, which is similarly free, and accessible to tens of thousands of young people around the world, if we consider the circumstance of its distribution 40 years ago, is ample evidence in a very small way of the ascent of man, and in fact is cause for optimism. How many people in the room are familiar with Students for Liberty? Okay. Dial back to 1970 when I was a young student, uh, through no fault of the world, through more a fault of my own, I couldn't have spelled libertarian. In fact, the first time that I came in contact with somebody who pretended or acted like a libertarian, uh, or purported, I should say, to be a liber in a libertarian, I remember it very well. It was in an um, uh, airplane terminal in Denver, and somebody had a big sign, and I guess they were raising money or something, and they purported to be, what was that guy's name, LaRouche? Yeah, they were a backer of, or a supporter or an acolyte or something of Lyndon LaRouche, and they had some sign about, you know, uh, killing Jane Fonda and getting rid of whales and stuff like that. And I remember thinking, well, you know, Jane Fonda is a hell of a lot better looking than you are. And I kind of like whales. And Doug Casey, in fact, told me some years later that I was a libertarian, and I said to Doug in my naive state, no, no, I'm not one of those guys. I like Jane Fonda. I like whales. <laughs> Doug mercifully was very kind, and he and Jack Pugsley gave me a copy of the wonderful Hazlitt book, uh, Economics in One Lesson. Pugsley was sort of like a doctor, take two pills, this book, call me in the morning. And it was wonderful. I come back to Students for Liberty because 40 years later, there's a student organization, really self-organizing. They have 160,000 kids worldwide, uh, 12 of them in Rwanda, uh, a country that until recently I couldn't spell, are in touch with me. Uh, via email and Skype. And one example of the philosophical ascent of man is uh, dealing with these brilliant, beautiful, young African students who know way more about Austrian economics and freedom than I ever will. So the situation, if you fast forward, goes from one kid who was predisposed to libertarianism but didn't know what it was or how to spell it in 1970 to a spontaneously organized student group worldwide that has 160,000 people, which is in fact one of several. It's difficult when I talk to these kids to work up too much pessimism. My suspicion is that despite whatever impacts all of you negatively, if you think about your life now, if you think about the opportunities that are available to you, if you think about the comforts that you have, if you think about the books that you're able to read, if you think about the fact that you're absolutely able to A, afford the time, and B, afford the charge of coming to either the Sprott Conference or Capitalism and Morality, and you compare it to where you were 30 years ago or 40 years ago, or compare it to the opportunities available for most of mankind at that point in time, you aren't merely better off, you're almost unimaginably better off in your lifetime. Doug Casey, points out, I use Doug as a prop a lot, first of all, because he's easy to quote, easier to pick on, but he says very smart things. Uh, he accurately says that the largest unbroken un bull market that he's aware of is the ascent of man. And mercifully for all of us, it goes on and on and on. It doesn't mean that the ascent of man is unpunctuated. You know, we've had, <laughs> we've had the odd thing go wrong. Uh, you know, World War I, World War II. <laughs> 
It isn't as though we haven't conspired to defeat ourselves, but we've never really truly succeeded in defeating ourselves. When I look around the world now, and I compare it with maybe when I was in my 20s or 30s, which is the first time that I had sort of the cognitive skills to understand what was going on around me, and I compare what's happened over the last four decades, uh, the case for pessimism, other than our technological ability to kill each other much more efficiently, seems to me to be gone. In the, uh, in the 70s, of course, we had a sort of a Malthusian groupthink. You'll remember Jeremy Rifkin and Jimmy Carter and the Club of Rome. You don't take special skill to be that stupid, actually. Uh, you'll remember uh, that that school of thought said that by the year 2000, the oil price would be $200 a barrel, that 20 million people a year were going to be dying of starvation, that in fact the world was going to run out of commodities, and catastrophe was nigh, sort of like Y2K. Uh, fast forward to 2000, unfortunately for me, because I was in the oil business, the price of oil was $20, not $200 a barrel. Uh, global commodity prices were at uh, multi-century lows <laughs> in real terms. And going further forward than that to today, uh, as recently as 1970, the greatest public health problem in frontier markets around the world places like Malawi, was starvation. Fairly basic problem. The greatest public health crisis right now in Malawi is obesity. Now, I'm not saying that obesity, obesity is a metaphor for the ascent of man, but I suspect that if you talk to an obese person in Malawi and you ask them if they would rather be fat or starving, that from that person's point of view, they're substantially better off than they were before. And I would ask you to think about what is available to an individual peasant in Malawi and how he or she views the change in circumstance that has existed over the last 40 years. Why is this? Why is this? Well, for one thing, we take our successes, societal and individual, for granted. Very often in polls, when they're polling business people, as an example, in the United States, the countries go into hell in a handbasket. How are you going to do next year? Oh, business is fantastic. <laughs> Maybe it's that we're individually self-confident self and collectively untrusting. I, I, I can't tell you the answer to that. What I do know is consistently when I talk to people about their lives and how their lives are doing, well, their lives are improving. Now, there are certain people who think that their lives should be improving more rapidly than they are, and there's a whole bunch of people who are envious enough to think that although they've done well, if I've done better, they're deserving and I'm a jerk. I get all that. I get all that. But if you look at it objectively, you know, I mean, it, envy's a common state. And envy may actually be good if you think about the fact that as a society we get ahead when individual members in society strive. I'm not so sure envy's a bad thing. Uh, Ayn Rand taught us. Course. What was the what was the essay, Doug? Virtues <coughs> of selfishness. Thank, yeah, thank you. The virtues of selfishness, I think, is probably, in some substantial measure, responsible for the ascent of man. But that's that maybe that's next year's lecture, and you can do it, Jayant, not me. <laughs> the other thing that's certainly true is that in terms of publications, in terms of how we're taught to think, at least by the private sector who has to make some money teaching us how to think, is that fear outsells satisfaction and fear outsells satisfaction by a wide margin. The best gauge of investor sentiment that I know is Agora, Agora Publishing. How many of you are Agora customers? Great. This is going to be recorded, so Agora will never say a nice thing about me again for the rest of time, which is probably OK. Two things that I want to draw your attention to with regards to Agora. They're a spectacular contrary indicator. Whatever subject is selling best as a newsletter is going to crush, going to get crushed. Uh, you sell people uh, not by educating, but rather by affirming. People's expectation of the future is set by their experience in the immediate past. So as an example, if Bitcoin has done okay, in other words, if it's no longer cheap, it's extremely popular. Uh, if it has to go up, it's because nobody likes it. You can't sell any newsletters based on it. 
if it's already gone up and people's experience of the past in the future has been tempered by their experience of the past, it sells like hotcakes. But the other thing is, if you look at Agora headlines, nothing sells like fear. The pitch, uh, and this is a little pessimistic, but we don't read too many of these direct mail publications. Anyway, the pitch is the world is going to end Thursday, and here's how you can profit. Here's how you can profit. It's true. I remember a great example of this. Again, I'm picking on poor Doug. I forget the year, but it would have been in the 90s when the, um, the, uh, the Gulf War, the first Gulf War, was taking place. And Bonnie and I were at the New Orleans Investment Conference, uh, and it was over Halloween. And if any of you who haven't been to New Orleans on Halloween, I recommend it. The town takes Halloween seriously. Anyway, Doug Casey comes out on stage for his speech. And, you know, a great big guy like this. He's got a Saddam Hussein mask on. He didn't fool many people, of course, you know, a six foot five inch shambly Saddam Hussein. Uh, but he has a Saddam Hussein mask, and the, uh, the crowd laughs. And Doug finally takes off his mask and says, You know, I just wanted to see the audience's uh, reaction. It's interesting to me that you all are afraid of Saddam Hussein. I'm not afraid of Saddam Hussein at all. I'm afraid of George Bush. Think about it. Think about the relative, think about what you have to fear. Saddam Hussein doesn't know who you are. He doesn't care who you are. He will never charge you a tax. He will never subject you to a regulation. He will never draft your son or daughter. And you're afraid of Saddam Hussein, and you're not afraid of George Bush. The point of all this is that I think we are preconditioned to the drama of fear rather than the rationality of satisfaction and optimism, despite the fact that in our careers we have overcome those things that we have feared repeatedly, not merely as individuals, but also as a society. We heard earlier today about uh, extinction, about environmental damage, one of the things that we learn is that as societies become richer, one of the things that they tend to do with their economic surplus is in fact improve the physical environment that they inhabit. Yes, in fact, as we consume, we do damage consuming. But over time, we learn how to take yields per acre from 30 bushels to 40 bushels to 80 bushels to 90 bushels. And in fact, we have a circumstance now in the United States where there is substantially more forest cover than there was in 1900. And I'm supposed to be pessimistic. Interesting. Interesting set of circumstances to me. Now it's going to get a little bit commercial because I want to give you a, I want to give you a couple of examples uh, and the only examples that I can give you, not having too much experience, at least in terms of communicating outside commerce, I'm going to go back to what I do. Um, I think you all know that I'm in the natural resource business, and the natural resource business is the most capital intensive, the most cyclical business that I know. There may be others that are stranger, but I don't know any that are stranger. And it's a business that I've become relatively successful at because I've learned relatively some of the lessons in the past. The most important lesson in this business, of course, is that you will either be a contrarian or you're going to be a victim. That's the nature of cyclicality. When things look absolutely bleak in my business, when things like, look like they're never going to improve, you have to work up the guts to write some checks to good people because the very fact that things are awful mean that they're going, in fact, to get better. I mean, this is something I've learned but I don't apply it as well as I ought to. So at one point in time, I think it was 2006 or something, there wasn't very much for me to buy. Now, when there isn't much to buy, that's telling you that you ought to be selling. And I did sell some. I sold probably 30% of my portfolio. The other 70% proceeded immediately to fall by 50 or 55%. You know, it's sort of the third or fourth time I'd been through this, so I was wondering if I was sort of doomed to be perpetually stupid. 
and I called one of my gurus, uh, Ned Goodman, and I, you know, sort of my, well, he'd probably like being called my rabbi, my confessor, and I said to Ned, uh, I can't believe I did this to myself again, Ned. He's been through a couple more cycles than me. Can you help me? And he says, well, kind of. I can help you with your attitude. First thing to know is that the next cycle, you're going to do it again. <laughs> so the first thing I asked him, I said, is this just a Gentile joke? I mean, is that, is, is that where this is going? <laughs> he mercifully laughed. Political correctness is not one of his faults. He said, no, it worked like this, Rick. You've worked very hard. You're very self-confident. And you believe in your mind that you're a better analyst than your competitors. And it's true. And you believe that you buy better managers because you've known them. And that's true, too. And you believe that you focus on the best deposits, which is similarly true. And finally, you're realistic yourself with regards to balance sheets, income statements, and your plans for companies. And that's all true, too. But a bear market takes no prisoners. And the fact that you buy better companies that are smarter doesn't matter. And your portfolio goes off the edge. You are responding, among other things, to the needs of your customers. You'll understand now that I'm blaming you for my actions. Um, anyway, uh, he said, uh, and actually that's a good thing. Because when this market begins to bottom out, you're going to pull yourself up, dust yourself off, sell the things that didn't work, buy new things, and you're going you're to participate in the bull cycle. I still wasn't feeling good. And he says, OK, Rick, let's do arithmetic. You come into a cyclical market with $100,000. Everybody comes in at the top because the narrative, we went through that before, right? Your expectation of the past is set, of the, of the future, pardon me, is set by your experience in the immediate past. So you come in with $100,000 at the top and you work hard. You're not one of those dolts. You work hard. <laughs> the market falls apart. So you turn, for all your good work, you turn 100 into 50. That's kind of what happens. Not so good. But you stick with it. You redeploy the 50, and you turn the 50 into 500. Pretty good. You're proud of yourself because you turn the 50 into 500, so you overstay your welcome. And you turn the 500 into 200. Not so good. But you remember your last experience, maybe. You redeploy. You go through some ugly times, soul searching. And you turn the 200 into 2 million. Now you're feeling really good, in fact. You know, people are even telling you you're good. You've attracted the attention of other people. And as a consequence of that, in your hubris, uh, you turn the two million into 800,000. Not good. You call your father confessor, Ned, say, how on earth did I do this again? And then you turn the 800,000 into eight million. So over the course of 30 years, arithmetically, this isn't necessarily autobiographical, you turn $100,000 into $8 million and you beat yourself up in bear markets. Think about the futility of pessimism. Think about getting shaken out of the bottom because everybody gets into the top. Another example uh, from this year's uh, Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting. Buffett was talking about the inevitability of a bear market and the fact that over time, bear markets do not matter. Buffett pointed out that in the 45 or 50 some odd years that he and Munger have operated Berkshire Hathaway, that the share price in an 18 month period has fallen by 50% or more. I pulled up a long term chart of Berkshire Hathaway. And you know what? You can't see the declines. 50% declines, if you look over 45 years from inception to today, you actually can't see on a chart. Maybe younger people with better eyes than I could see the decline, but you absolutely can't see the declines in the long-term chart of Berkshire Hathaway. That doesn't disguise the fact that if you went through them, they didn't cause you some trauma. They, in fact, did. But if you let the trauma shake you out of something that you understood and had conviction for, what the trauma was was a hiccup. Vancouver real estate, you talk to people with regards to Vancouver real estate now, nothing other than the city council and NDP government uh, could make it go wrong. Uh, in fact, in the 1968 to 1970 period, the price of Vancouver real estate fell by 50%. In 1990 and 91, the price of Vancouver real estate fell by 50%. 1999 and 
if this city council has its way, it might fall by 70%. Um, think about what Vancouver real estate, I'm tempted to say X the NDP, but the other ones aren't any better, really. Uh, this is a very, very, very nice place to live. And you'll, and I'm not saying to go out and buy some Vancouver real estate, by the way. I'm just pointing out the futility of, the futility of pessimism, the replacement cost of Vancouver real estate, the scarcity that's involved. If you have the ability to participate, uh, suggests um, never mind financially. It's a hell of a place to live. Uh, that you put yourself in a place where you can survive these declines so that you can enjoy the ascent both of Vancouver uh, and the ascent of man. It's interesting that when all of us, despite the fact that we've had wonderful lives, and we come here in a wonderful city with wonderful friends to a wonderful conference put on by Rajni and Jayant, who are wonderful people, it's interesting that when we uh, exist in this just absolutely beautific environment that we're afraid of everything. We think of the world as a place beset by Christ, problems, litter, crime. The facts are different. The world is the most peaceful right now than it's ever been. The incidence of violent crime, at least in the West, in North America, is the lowest in recorded history. People on average and individually are richer than they have ever been. The truth is that, at least in economic senses, our education and our technology are generating margins, generating utility for us as individuals that overcome even the depredation of the state. Can you imagine that? As pernicious as the state has become, we still beat the bastards. We still beat the bastards, despite all of this idiocy that we do when they allow us to vote. We still get richer when we work. I mean, we still are smarter when we work, smart enough that we overcome how stupid we are when we vote. <laughs> We're better connected. I talk to young kids in Rwanda who lecture me on Austrian economics. It's truly spectacular. Never mind economically, just the amusement of being lectured by young black Austrian Mau Maus. Uh, wonderful set of circumstances. And we're smarter. We're absolutely positively smarter. Think about the connection that you have right now to people who know something that you want to know. I mean, it used to be that you used to have to trudge on down to the library and you ha used to have to get the, uh, what was it called? The Guide to Periodi Periodical Literature or something like that. I mean, you had to be really smart to get smart. Now you get on your phone. I mean, if Bonnie and I ever have any arguments, she gets on Google right now and shows me why she's right. It's instantaneous. <laughs> and it's wonderful, this sort of connectedness to people who can give us information that we want, who are smarter than us, makes us smarter. And it makes us smarter in five minutes or six minutes or seven minutes. Even the problem that Adrian described, which is the fact that we've become distracted and short-term oriented, goes partly to the fact that we can get more done in a short period of time than we used to be able to get done in a long period of time. Now, Adrian, I have to tell you, the fact that um, I haven't suffered through very much epic poetry lately is something that I think of as a real benefit, but we'll leave that part aside too. One of the other things that I've noticed is that some of the things that we criticize, some of the things that make us pessimistic, ought to make us optimistic. And I think that has to do with the way that we and other people label things. I think that political correctness is a cause for optimism for two reasons. One, it gives me something to parody and lampoon uh, in a way that everybody in the audience won't think of as education, but rather as affirmation. And that's always useful as a public speaker. You know, education is futile, uh, but affirmation is a wonderful selling tool. But more importantly, I am told at Sprott that I must bring our labor force to 50% female. Now, the fact that I have to bring it to 50% female pisses me off. 
I don't want to demean a woman by saying that I hired her because of her plumbing, right? I don't like that, and I don't like to be told by some schmuck what I have to do. But the idea that my business was better off 40 years ago when all of my peers were old, fat, bald, white guys like me, the idea that I accessed the intellect of 4 or 5% of humanity was profoundly stupid. My business in the 1970s was me. Uh, I mean, never mind it was white, it was damn near all blonde. There was a, there was a, success, a suggestion at that point in time that people that were from Northern Europe were somehow more competent than the rest of the world. If you think what we've done to the world, it's pretty obvious that that wasn't the case. So I'm being forced to do the right thing. Not the right thing from a political correctness point of view. I'm being forced to acknowledge that one half of mankind, that part which has indoor plumbing, has as much to contrib contribute as the part of mankind that has outdoor plumbing. I challenge, I absolutely challenge any psychologist, uh, what do they call people who study like anatomy and stuff, anatomists? I study, I challenge any scientist to get a connection between one's plumbing and one's cerebral cortex or cerebral medulla. So I'm being forced, in fact, to do something that it should have occurred to me to, should, should have occurred to me to do naturally. Uh, ethnicity. Uh, Giant makes a wonderful case that uh, uh, Indians have, you know, absolutely no definable benefit to mankind. Uh, <laughs> he's wrong. You know, the truth is he's wrong. If you get Indians out of Indian, they do wonderful things like Giant and Rajni have done here. When you look at Sprott, uh, the advancements that we've enjoyed as an, as an organization as, in, as a consequence of South Asian employees, it's wonderful. And I suspect, Jayant, I understand the reasons for your prejudice. It's interesting. I mean, one amazing part of political correctness is the fact that the most racist anti-Indian person I know has the last name Bandari. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that in itself is cause for optimism. <laughs> But I suggest, Jayant, that as chaotic and corrupt as you find Bhopal today, and I'm not talking about the disaster that killed 30,000 people, but I suggest that if you have a look at the Bhopal of today versus the Bhopal of 50 years ago, while you wish it had advanced further, that the difference between then and now is both dramatic and superb. I understand, believe me, your wish uh, that tribal peoples, including my tribe, the sort of northern European mongrel, uh, certainly we wish that we would have done better, we wish that you would have done better. But the fact is that our wish, if we allow it to uh, shape our expectations without rationally viewing the facts, uh, our wishes are irrelevant. And it's odd, it's odd that our wishes are driven by fear rather than hope. If we use the experience of thinking about what could be, and we use that to avoid the optimism that comes naturally from observing what has been, uh, it, it makes us our own worst enemy. Some of you were here some years ago when I gave my first speech at Capitalism and Morality. And I was talking about risk at that point in time, something that I'm really familiar with because I, I exist in a very risky business, and I sort of pointed out that people use risk sometimes as a crutch, as an excuse to fail. Uh, I've learned as an investor, you know, some guy will say, oh, that goddamn Trump, that schmuck Trudeau. Uh, your biggest risk, believe me, or at least my biggest risk, is easy to find. It's to the left of my right ear and to the right of my left ear. You get these cards dealt with you. I mean, yeah, Trudeau says these incredibly stupid things, the budget will balance itself, you know, only a dramatic job. I'm three minutes, so I can do this, I can do this. The fact is that these kind of things are gonna come up from time to time, and if you look back in history, while they're aggravating, they don't matter. It's how you respond to them. The other thing is, don't absorb too many uh, of other people's problems. Uh, you know, I, I sort of regard the ability to deal with other people's problems as a consumer good. Uh, I like doing it. Uh, I like to be helpful. I like philanthropy. My friend Doug Casey talks about the futility of philanthropy. 
I've had a lot of fun being philanthropic. But remember that other people's problems are just that. They're their problems. Your life, uh, if you choose to dwell, if you choose to dwell on pessimism, you're going to achieve your goal, I promise you. Uh, and, and the truth is that that, um, that circumstance uh, is neither rational nor useful. So I hope in the 30 minutes I've had to talk to you that you understand that while the situation is indeed hopeless, for you personally, it need not be serious. Thank you. One quick question, if there's any. <laughs> All right. Oh, wait, I have a question. Uh-oh. No, 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 I'm serious. I'm very serious. Is there any ruling? You have to make 50% of your workforce female, but do they have to have the same uh, level of jobs, or is it going to be all just the operations? You're still going to have all the guys uh, being brokers, and all the girls are behind. I'm just curious if they gave you any direction that way? No, the 50% the requirement is what government right now would call an aspirational requirement. Mm. If they required us to have 50% female workers right now, the males would vote against them. Uh, remember, elections being an advanced auction of stolen property, they can't disenfranchise a group as large as all men. Yours is a great question. Mm. The opportunity, of course, is to Utilize people whose skill set are appropriate for the opportunity, uh, irrespective of gender. I get it, but again, what a bullshit. <laughs> Agreed. All, all I was trying to say is that while the regulation is stupid and offensive, the goal is highly intelligent. Why would I deprive myself uh, from the competence of half of humankind? Thank you very much.